Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning. The next time you get to see Karen Menace, you need to tell her to not pray so hard. She put on Facebook that she was praying for some soft rain to soften the earth for preparing it for winter. And boy, did we have a storm up in Muscatine at least. Not down here? No. So. There are a number of announcements that are in your bulletin. We are having our Tuesday Bible study by Zoom. Our Wednesday Bible study in Meepo, in person. Note, though, it's a week ahead that... Uh, Tuesday, September 15th, the session will be meeting. Today, immediately following the service, Koinonia will meet over by the organ to talk about what you're going to do. Are there other announcements that we need to make at this time? Well, seeing none, then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude. morning. Please stand and read responsibly in the call to worship as it's written in the bulletin. Let us turn to the Lord our God with humility. For the contrite heart, he will not turn away. Let us turn to the Lord our God with sincerity. For he calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. Let us turn to God with confidence. For he cares for us with steadfast love. Praise the Lord. Please remain standing while we sing our opening hymn, number 300, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Jesus. 
Seated. Okay, please join me in reading the response of reading number 67 in your living Bible. It's about Labor Day. There is a right time for everything. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest. What does one really get from hard work? I have thought about this in connection with all the various kinds of work God has given to mankind. Everything is appropriate in its own time. But though God has planted eternity in the hearts of men, even so, man cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I conclude that, first, there is nothing better for a man than to be happy and to enjoy himself as long as he can. And second, that he should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of his labors, for these are gifts from God. Now here is the command, dear brothers, given in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by his authority. Stay away from any Christian who spends his days in laziness and does not follow the ideal of hard work we set up for you. For you know well that if you want to follow our example, you never saw us loafing. We never accepted food from anyone without buying it. We worked hard day and night for the money we are needed to live on, in order that we should, would not be a burden to any of you. It wasn't that we didn't have the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to show you firsthand how you should work for your living. And even while we were still there with you, we gave you this rule. He who does not work shall not eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living in laziness, refusing to work, and wasting your time gossiping. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we appeal to such people. We command them to quiet down, get to work, and earn their own living. And to the rest of you I say, dear brothers, never be tired of doing right. Look around you. Vast fields of human souls are ripening all around us and are ready now for reaping. The reapers will be paid good wages and will be gathering eternal souls into the granaries of heaven. What joys await the sower and the reaper, both together. For it is true that one sows and someone else reaps. I sent you to reap where you didn't sow. Others did the work, and you received their harvests. When we gather to praise God, we remember that we are people who have preferred our wills to His. Accepting His power to become new persons in Christ, let us confess our sins before God and one another as we first confess together using the unison prayer of confession printed in your bulletin, and then by coming silently before the throne of God as individuals. Let us pray. Infinite Father, in the stillness of this moment, let the hush of your presence fall upon us that in adoration we may become aware that we cannot renew ourselves, but can only be renewed by you that we cannot forgive ourselves, but can only accept your forgiveness, that we cannot love one another as we ought, but we must follow you of others through us. Help us, O Lord, to become stronger in the face of pressure all around us. As our world grows darker, may we walk as the children of the light. As the danger around us increases, Help us to become braver. As our society becomes more depraved, help us to become compromising in our standards. As we become discouraged, give us the strength to help them persist. May we always be aware of our need for you, O Lord. And may we ever feel your presence and your love, forgiving us and strengthening us that we might be better witnesses for you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Rejoice and be glad. Our God is full of mercy, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Dare to believe in the gift of a new beginning and be at peace. Please read with me the unison prayer for illumination as it is written in your bulletin. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our epistle reading today is from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. It can be found on page 1765 in the Pew Bible. A hurried reading of this passage may give the impression that Paul is addressing people with a much bigger sin problem than we have. After all, how hard is it not to harm your neighbor or to avoid drunkenness and debauchery? But he also mentions a few sins that are less obvious, like quarreling and jealousy. These may not cause immediately obvious harm, but they destroy relationships just as thoroughly and need Paul's wake-up call just as much. Romans 13, 8-14. Let no debt remain outstanding, except for the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not cover, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Our gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. It can be found on page 1527 in the Pew Bible. When someone treats us badly, our inclination is often to break off any kind of friendly relationship with that person and tell someone else how badly that person treated us. Jesus doesn't allow for either of these reactions, instead telling us to start by talking to the other person alone about what is wrong. Only when that fails do we get to go to other people about it, and then only for the purpose of attempted reconciliation. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. 
And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there, uh, there am I with them. This is the word of the Lord. Today's passage contains both one of my, I don't know, favorite in a way passages to preach on, but also one of my pet peeves in terms of misquoting or misuse of scripture. We're preaching from Mark. Chapter 18. I mean, uh, Matthew, excuse me. Chapter 18. This passage is one of my pet peeves because people take the. I tell you that if you, uh, wherever two or three are uh, come in my, together in my name, there I am with them. And they talk about it in terms of prayer because it also admonishes you to pray. This is not to knock praying together, but Jesus is here with us, whether we're in a group or whether we're alone. Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit. What this passage and verse is speaking of is actually authority. Authority within the church to deal with other people within the church. For wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. It is as if Christ is there. And that's actually some good news in a way. It goes right along with the rest of this passage. As Bob noted when he did the uh, liturgy or the reading and introduction this passage is primarily about reconciliation when you mention the word church discipline most of the time people shy away immediately they immediately get defensive they think of it in terms of excommunication which could be an ultimate thing and all negative stuff. But discipline always, with at least in other contexts, always has the intent to teach and realign the person who's being disciplined to be going back to where they should be. When you discipline your children as a parent, I assume that you did it not just because you like treating the kids that way, but for the purpose of encur encouraging them ultimately, teaching them, and helping them to stay on the right path. Disciple means to learn. To be a disciple. Discipline means to learn. And as Pauline noted last week, the church is made up of diverse members and we will irritate one another. It's actually an opportunity to grow. And we shouldn't look at it as negatively as we automatically tend to do. Sometimes though it goes beyond irritation. Sometimes there is actual hurt. And Oftentimes, it's unintended. 
Sometimes it is malicious in some ways. However justified they may feel it is. And the good news is that the Bible gives us a way to handle this. Gives us clear-cut steps towards addressing this problem. Now again, we must distinguish between those sinning against you and those simply annoying you, because Jesus has no words for the latter, which tells us how important it is or not. But when we do have sinning against us, there is a process that we can use. And its goal is reconciliation. Jesus' teaching contrasted with that of the Jews who preferred that the offender seek forgiveness first. As many as three times before witnesses with the family. We'll get into that actually next week as we move on to the next passage. And Peter asks a, a very important question. How, much, how often do I have to forgive? And interestingly, Jesus affirms that reprimand must precede punishment. The offender must have the opportunity to repent. So if we look at this, it says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. Now, I know that can be hard. If you've been hurt, then one of the hardest things you can do is go to the one that hurt you. And in a manner that is not one of anger yourself or fear, all of which are natural things to feel, go and tell them, look, this really hurt. And this goes beyond annoyance. And I think that in this particular case, you have committed something against me. And you want to do it out of a sense of love. Again, not anger or fear or retribution. The goal is to bring your brother or sister back into relationship with you and with others. Because frankly, no person's an island, no sin affects only yourself. Even if it is a self-sin. It affects those with whom you are in relationship with. So you go there to discuss it. And it can be hard, but it's worthwhile. Because if they listen to you, you have won your brother over. And then it's done. You have relief. You've been able to share your feelings. They, might, they should ask for forgiveness. You have the opportunity to give it. That if there's repentance, they're turning around, they're changing. Don't expect perfection. It's not going to happen. But hopefully there will be progress. Which really is what discipleship is all about. Progress. But let's say they say, no way, Jose, that wasn't a problem, or leave me alone, it's my sin, not yours. Well, in that case, it says to take one or two others along, that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Basically, you approach them again. I know if it was hard the first time, it can be even harder the second time. I mean, you failed the first time. But you bring a couple of people. And this serves some purposes that are important. Um, number one, it fits the Jewish tradition and understanding of legality, if you will. No testimony in court was considered persuasive unless there were at least two witnesses to it. Two, unfortunately, had to be male adult witnesses. 
I think women counted as half and children as a quarter or something like that. Maybe not at all. So you take a couple of people with you, and this is not to spread the issue around. So you need to be careful who you choose. I would recommend that one of them be a mediator of some sort. They can still act as a witness, even as they are attempting to be there to try and bring the two of you together. Because the goal, again, is reconciliation, not punishment. Now, the person who's being approached may feel outnumbered and get even more defensive. And so it's incumbent upon you to make it clear that this is not the case. That you are truly seeking to reconcile. That you are truly seeking to reestablish the relationship that you had. And that these folks that are with you are here to help in that process. Since occasionally when people get angry, they throw accusations around that may or may not have any basis. We're trying to keep it, as I like to say, at the level of a discussion or debate and not an argument. Do you know the difference between those? Discussion is a dialogue between two people where each one is listening to hear what the other needs to say. A debate is still civil and each side presents its case. And frankly, by the time you've hit, you have a dialogue between the two of you, by the time you bring witnesses, it's probably a debate. You each present your side of the story or your f understanding of the facts. And you have the opportunity to be persuasive. And the other person can't interrupt, unlike presidential debates. When you're actually doing debates, each side gets a certain amount of time to present its side, its case, and then an attempt to be persuasive. And then a moderator makes their judgment or offers some sort of path, third way, that you may not have thought of. An argument, really, you don't care. All you want to do is win. And if it means throwing out false accusations, if it means bringing up something from years ago that you know is going to make the other person cringe and fall back, if, if it means saying things that you don't even mean, just so that you can gain an advantage in the moment. That's an argument. And frankly, that is totally unproductive. And in fact, usually detrimental. I go through this every time I do premarital counseling. Because I think it's important for couples to understand that difference. Discussion's great. Debate is okay. If you hit, hit the point of argument, you need to step back. So you want to try and keep this at the level of a discussion or a debate with the witnesses there. The assumption here by Jesus is that it's clear enough cut that it can be seen that you have been sinned against, by the way. A lot of times I think the two or three witnesses may discover that it's been a tit for tat kind of situation. Maybe they sinned against you, but they felt like you sinned against them first. So there's a chance for reconciliation because you may not realize what you had done. It takes two to tango, as they like to say. But in the case where there is a clear and definite understanding of who sinned against who, 
and that person refuses to repent of their sin. And maybe it's not, although it says against you, this also goes for holding each other accountable in the church. If someone is consistently, persistently sinning, again, you approach them first by yourself, then you come with two or three as witnesses and mediators. In addiction language, we call that intervention. And if they refuse to sin, then it says you take it to the church. Now, this does not normally mean you would come up to the front and talk from the pulpit and say, Bonnie has sinned. That is not what it means. But we have a governing body called the session. They are elected by you as spiritual leaders in the church. I know that we tend to think of them as administrators, but their initial roles were far more spiritual in nature. Every elder needs to be ready to teach. Actually, it says in our book of order, every elder needs to be ready to preach. I know of one elder who had a stock sermon that he kept for over 18 years in the time that I knew him. So that if ever the pastor suddenly lost his voice or had to go somewhere because a family member died or whatever, and he was asked to preach, he'd just pull that thing out and he would be able to give a message for the morning. It was an interesting concept. In a 1906 session notes kind of thing uh, that I read once, I think it was about 1906, I was doing research on that period between 1900 and 1925, I read something that simply would never fly or rarely fly in today's churches. The session minutes noted that there were two families, two members of two families, member of each family, who had some sort of conflict between them that had developed almost into a feud, if you will. And they had gone to both of them separately. Then they had gone to them with two or three people following the biblical method. And then the session, they went to the session, the people who were trying to relieve this situation. And the session issued a call to these two individuals, brought them up before the session, and gave them an ultimatum. They said that you will reconcile, or you will both be put outside the church. Because we're not going to split the church over your private feud. I was like, wow. Can you imagine trying to do that today? And yet that's what the Bible calls us to do. That's what the Bible says. If that person refuses to listen to the witnesses, take it to the church leadership in order that spiritual direction may be determined. Is this person a poison or a toxin that is going to actually destroy the church? And if it is so, and they refuse to repent, it knows to treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. They need to be removed. They need to be removed from perhaps not just church membership, but relationally. The Amish call that practice shunning. I don't know that you need to go that far. In fact, it seems overly harsh to me in many ways, but I understand it. Some relationships, and you know this with kids again, or maybe yourself when you were growing up, and your parents told you don't run with the wrong crowd. Sometimes relationships are destructive, and those relationships need to be broken. Until there's been a change 
in character and heart. Sometimes it takes that breaking in order to make the person totally aware and repent. Again, using the model of addiction, you let them hit rock bottom. It's hard. They call it tough love frequently. You got to let them hit the bottom before they can start making their way back up. And you hope and pray that that bottom is not going to be the death of that person or relationship. You're always ready to extend the hand. But for many of us, the only way we learn is by going through it. And he notes that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is again in regards to the church. If you remove them from the church, they are removed. Hard news to hear. Hard message to hear. But one that ultimately is for the good of the church. Sometimes, if it's extended to the point to where there's been that kind of conflict that's church-wide, there may be a designated leader, if reconciliation occurs, who needs to put it to the church to make the move towards reconciliation. Pauline, when she was in high school, went to a fundamentalist Baptist church independent church, something like that. And we visited there once. And I was fascinated by something that occurred during that time. The pastor brought forward a young couple. She was obviously pregnant. And he looked at the congregation and he sa said their names, you know who they are. He said, they have committed the sin of fornication. They weren't married. But they are getting married. They have repented of their sin. They are following direction. They are under supervision. And then he looked at the congregation and he said, now it's your turn and your role to open your arms and love them. Do not shun them simply because you can see their sin. For they have repented. And they're taking those steps. And frankly, sometimes that's harder for the church to do than it is to condemn. I see so many celebrity Christians, especially musicians, who have some fall of some sort of divorce. And then, oh no, their record sales just plummet. Even when there's been testimony that they have had some sort of restoration or reconciliation, even if it doesn't mean remarriage. And it's very difficult for them to ever get back into, it seems, the good graces of so many people because they expect perfection. You're not perfect. Why should you expect it of them? So we have this process where there has been sin, and there has been an attempt at reconciliation. And that is always the goal. When we do that, while it's hard, we should actually feel good about it. When we do it right, there should be that sense of peace at the end of it. Because we know that we have done it in love, through the Spirit, by the process that Jesus has set before him. Before us. Now, I don't know what kind of sins you have experienced in your life, people who have sinned against you. I don't know how long ago it was, because you know, sometimes some sins, people hold 
for decades. But let me give a suggestion to you, especially during this time when I see the need for reestablishment of relationships. We're so isolated by the COVID. We are isolated actually by our technology. Make the attempt to reconcile with those whom you have had a close relationship with in the church, in your family, and even outside the church. It's going to take work, but all relationships do. And never be afraid, as it notes in here, to ask for support. I think that's the other thing that we find hard. We don't want to ask for help. We can handle this ourselves. You know, there's a lot of marriages that break up because of that. We think we can handle this ourselves. Well, no, you can't or you wouldn't be to this situation. So ask for help. Ask for it from somebody that you respect, somebody that you know can keep confidentiality. Ask for help from those that are spiritual leaders within the church, folks that you've already placed your trust in. And most of all, ask God to give you the strength you need to do the things you have to do so that he might get the glory in the end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our next hymn is number 315, I Am Resolved. And please note that we are going to sing verse 1 in the chorus and then verse 2, 3, 4, 5 before we sing the chorus again.
can't remember if during my sermon I mentioned why that passage was actually one of my fa more favorite ones. But I think this hymn in its last verse kind of addressed this, addresses it. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. I'm one of these people I like to know how. And this has very clear instructions. Even if I can't always follow. One of the ways that we show our gratitude to God is through the giving of our tithes and offerings. The plates are in the back. But in order to help you to be in a cheerful and giving frame of mind, I ask you to take a couple of minutes here now and meditate on God's blessings in your life and His goodness to you as we listen to this meditative music. Pastor John. Yes. Do you want the doxology following? I had planned on it. seated. Thank you, Pamela, for that meditation. There's a balm in Gilead. I think that was particularly appropriate, given both the hard message that had to be preached and the concept of reconciliation that was integral to it. One of the ways that we care for each other in the body of Christ is praying for and with each other. You have joys and concerns that are listed in your bulletin. I ask you to please pray for those folks. By name, I got to talk to a number of them during this last week and hear up updates on things. There's one that's listed in here just a Barb Monday, but I would note that we need special prayers for the, the family. They've been called in. It seems that she took a turn, downturn. So Christine's sister. Uh, so please pray for them at this time in a special way. Are there other joys or concerns to share with the body. Bob? 
I have a friend from school back years ago, Mark Plant, whose youngest daughter passed away two days ago at 42. His name is Michael Plant. Mark Laplante. L A P A P L A N T E. Mark Laplante. His daughter was Stephanie. Daughter died. At forty two. Do we have any other joys? It's a joy. Having Pamela back, by the way, playing. I feel so very blessed uh, for so many reasons, but uh, do I want to have another hip replacement? No, I don't, but my goodness, the recovery has just been so, after the first couple of weeks, so very easy and it's done so well. So. The technology that they've come up with now to be able to replace these body parts and it's just, God is good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So thanks for relief through the surgery. Anyone else want to share their joys or concerns? Well, I do have another one. Uh, I don't know how many of you will remember the bank lease, but my bills, my brother-in-law, Bill's older daughter, Sherry, has a daughter uh, who just got married this weekend and out in Utah. And I have a classmate whose granddaughter is getting married out in California where all the fires have been and, and these kids have not had any idea to find. One thing they wanted to be sure that they had with them was their marriage license. If they got sent out, they were going to get married, and they were going to get married in public. And I just think that's marvelous that we have, with everything that's going on, that we still have young people getting married. That's a good thing. <laughs> Her name is Bethany. Okay. Any other joys? We have two great granddaughters that have come to visit us for a couple of weeks with their parents and us, and they brought their mother with them, but their father had to stay back a place. Two great granddaughters visiting with mom. I'm glad they're here safely. Any other joys or concerns? That's great. There's so many joys. So let's come before God in prayer that we can celebrate and we can share. Lord God, our Father, creator of the universe and giver of every breath we take, we praise and we glorify you. You are an awesome God. You're all powerful. You're all-knowing. There's nothing you cannot do if it goes against you, if it is within your will and not against your nature. Lord, your love for us is so deep. We can scarcely fathom even the fringes of it. That steadfast, loyal, loving kindness. We don't deserve it can't earn it. Yet you give it to us freely along with the many blessings you place in our life because of your measureless grace. Lord, we thank you for the goodness in our lives. We thank you that reconciliation can be achieved 
between people within the church, and most of all with you, all through the person and work of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died to cleanse us of our sins and save us when we have repentant hearts. But then didn't stop there, but was resurrected that we might be new creatures in Him, have new lives in a, a new nature as the Spirit comes and dwells within us, making possible what we could not do just in our own strength. We give you thanks, Lord, that you have given Pam relief from her pain through the surgery, that her recovery has been going so well. We give you thanks for safe travel and the family bonds that occur so that great-granddaughters get to visit three, four generations. That's just wonderful. And we give you thanks that there are people like Bethany who are getting married even during this troubled time in the world. The fact is, people continue to grow, the world goes on, relationships form, and where you are there, love springs out. And we give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for family love, even though sometimes it entails pain. We pray for the family of Barb Mundy and for Christine, especially as they headed to go see her. Lord, may your will be made manifest. May they all experience peace in their hearts. That peace that passes understanding and only comes from you. Lord, death is always a tragedy for us who are left behind. We also ask for comfort for Mark LaPlante and his family, whose daughter died at the young age of 42. Lord, be with him and them. And may it be a time where they turn to you and not from you, where they remember your promise already fulfilled in Christ, and they remember the future that we have, where we shall see one another again and celebrate together your face in heaven. And Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world as every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father, making everything right that was wrong. And until that day, Holy Spirit, help us to have wisdom to gain in understanding and knowledge to see what is the best way to follow when we seek to follow you. Give us the courage of heart to step out in faith, to sometimes risk being vulnerable by opening ourselves up and sharing with someone who has sinned against us, by taking the steps for tough love sometimes. Strengthen us. And may your spirit flow through us. And may we have the perseverance to follow through to love again, to complete the tasks you have for us, to overcome the obstacles the world places before us, so that our witness is sure and our testimony faithful. And Holy Spirit be poured out upon this church, expand its boundaries and ministries, keep it from evil. Lord, may it be a light in the darkness of this world. And may we who are here be beacons of joy and of hope, of reconciling love, that lead others to know your love 
and your grace and your mercy, even as we have experienced them ourselves in Jesus Christ. Most of all, may they come to know you through us. And may all that we do and all that we say be to your praise and glory each and every day. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the same we taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would stand as you're able now and join me in singing from the gospel hymnal, number 127, Unworthy. I want to say something about this. You know how we're told that God will answer our prayers? It may be yes, it may be no, and it may be wait a while. Well, to the twins, I made a note many months ago that you wanted this song to be sung. So you had to wait, but here it is. <laughs> Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.